Hello? A rich tenor that I hoped wasn't attached to someone standing inside my place called into the house. I glanced at Ebony, eyes wide. She bounded out of the alcove. Eb, wait! I wanted to grab her in case it was a serial killer who haunted small towns and kidnapped cute black girls. Hey, we're back here! Brilliant, Eb. Tell him exactly where to find us. Chop us up and bury us in the backyard. Who's there? Footsteps sounded on the tile just inside the door. Hi, I'm here for Yvonne. I followed her around the corner. Way to tell a stranger exactly where we are, Ebony. You know this how the girl got murdered on last week's episode of The Butler Did It? My eyes sought out anything I could use for a weapon if I needed it. But then I realized that I wouldn't need a weapon, that was because I knew the man that was standing in my kitchen. I could never forget those soulful eyes, gorgeous dark skin, full lips, the blue scrubs that seemed cut to fit him precisely, the way they stretched across his chest and cradled his arms in such a nice way. And nurse, dude, I finally said, when I could find my voice, he was such a pleasant sight, considering that he was probably not a serial killer. Miss Gerard. Nurse dude, Miss Gerard, Ebony repeated, swiveling her head from me to him and back. You know him? I, I, how, what? I stuttered, then shook my head to arrange my thoughts and control my mouth into forming a complete sentence. This is my new place. Do you live close? Yes, I'd say I live close. He laughed, showing all of his teeth. I own the place. I left you the flowers and the note. I'm... I snapped my fingers and pointed. T.W. Taj Wright, registered nurse. The one and the same, he said, nodding modestly. I intended to be here when you pulled up. I don't normally work day shift, but I switched so I could be here. We had a last minute walk in and... He waved a hand, then tugged at the hem of his scrubs. So, welcome. Let me know if you have any questions. And you'll want to pull the moving truck into the driveway. It sticks out into the street and the neighbors. He hummed, wagging his head side to side while rolling his eyes. I'm not leaving again tonight, so use my space. Ebony? I hinted, since she had the key to the truck. But she stood there, her hands propped on her hips, and her chest pushed up and out. Ebony, go move the truck. Oh, right. She pulled the key from her pocket and teetered out on her stilettos. Be right back. I moved into the kitchen and leaned against the counter in front of the dishwasher. The scent of the air freshener hit me again, and I realized that he had been inside my home. It didn't feel like a violation, considering the house belonged to him. It was weird, though, knowing that he had set things up for me. Bought flowers, wrote a note. So? So? He mimicked, moving around the outside of the kitchen, leaning a set of meaty forearms into the counter, muscular without hulking out like an NFL fullback. Phew. Was I going to be living mere feet from him? Chapter 5. Look at God. Taj. My realtor's annoyance was evident through her short, pointed sentences. This is the final applicant. I took the liberty of pre-checking her background and history. Except for an incident ten years ago, she's clean. She has family nearby and has held a steady job for the past 36 months. She's about the best you're going to get and would be a perfect tenant. You should heavily consider her application. I opened the attachment, unbothered by her rude adjacent email. Applicants took the process more seriously when professionals handled it. I'd been searching for the perfect tenant for months, but wasn't impressed by the applicants Kate had brought to me. If someone was going to be living a stone's throw from my personal living space with access to my home, I wanted to have a good feeling. I was stalling, and Kate was getting sharp about it. I opened the attachment and smiled when I saw the name on the top line, Yvonne Gerard. As in the owner of those smoky brown eyes and those thick lips that had been haunting my memories, I laughed aloud, rubbing my palms together. Surprise move from your chest by mail, partner? Jocelyn tossed a couple of thick patient files in my direction and leaned against the desk, a hand on a shapely hip. We hadn't worked together since that stormy night, and her attitude seemed to have recovered from being rejected. Enough to flirt again, at least. Nah, just, I think I finally found a tenant. Oh, her pink-tinted lips poked out in a pout. You're not gonna let me live in your little extra house, then? I thought it was one of those post-coital utterings, 
something a person said in the heat of a moment but didn't mean. We'd had a great meal, a few glasses of potent wine, and more than a few rounds of pretty decent sex. She blurted out that she wouldn't mind living in the guest house so that I had access to her whenever I wanted her. I laughed it off, not at all considering letting a woman I was playing with live in my house. Besides, she made most of the moves in our situationship, and she'd rarely been denied. I already had access to her whenever I wanted her. I studied her, then looked away, then gave her my full attention. Jaws, I didn't think you were serious about that, were you? She snorted a laugh and hopped right up, feigning busyness with the stacks of folders on the desk. No, I'm not serious. Can you even imagine us living that close to each other? We'd never get out of bed. She snorted again, then conveniently found something to do in the back room. I replied to the open email, telling Kate that the applicant was approved, though I hadn't read anything past her name. As long as she passed the background check and could have the required funds available, she was welcome to the place. The ringer on my phone had been turned down so low I barely heard it, but I felt it tucked away in the breast pocket of my scrubs. I pulled it up before it could roll to voicemail. What up, broski? I practically yelled. Nothing much, brotastic. Cash Bridgman was always nonchalant, slow to speak, with a southern drawl that no one else in his family seemed to have. Going through some boxes in my parents' basement, getting them ready for their move. I found our demo tape, and I was listening to it. In that instant, a wave of nostalgia hit. The guys next door was an R&B group I had been a part of since I was a kid. We started as any typical boy group started. We were friends, went to school together, lived in the same neighborhood. We'd sit around and sing along to the radio. Offhand, one of our moms mentioned that we sounded good together. We went back to singing, but paid attention to the way we sounded together. We played at it mostly, singing at church and in talent shows. As we grew older and our voices blended into a more mature and soulful sound, we booked openings for groups coming through town. We worked as much as we could, which wasn't much because our moms were adamant that we stayed in school and kept our grades up. We still had chores at home, participated in school activities whenever possible, but we also would take a trip to sing at the drop of a hat. Devon James, Marquise Hillman, Corey Bridgman, and I each had a job. Devon and I worked the music. Keith was good at coming up with steps and figuring out our stage blocking, who went where at what part of the song. Corey, who we called Cash, was our point person for booking and payment. His dad was an accountant, so he helped us manage what little money we had. We never thought much would come of our group. We were the most professional amateurs we could be, and singing was something fun to do. But none of us had any connections that would push us out further. Until we opened for an up-and-coming R&B group called Tender Love Connection, and unbeknownst to us, some heavy hitters were in the crowd. All hell broke loose. By the end of the week, we'd signed a management deal and were invited to record a demo tape. Though we were based in Jacksonville, Florida, we started booking gigs across the South. Since it was summer, my mother, who was a teacher, could join us, giving us the freedom to take advantage of the spotlight shining on us. We were on the cusp of something great. We could feel it. Every night was filled with excited whispers about all that had happened that day and what was happening the next. When I started losing weight, I didn't think much of it. We were working hard, rehearsing every day, and the excitement produced nonstop adrenaline. Then came unexplainable bouts of severe fatigue, swollen glands, stomach pains. Mom insisted I take some time off. You're doing too much, Tosh, she said, fussing while packing my bag. You need a weekend at home with no excitement. Simmer down, get your bearings. I wasn't feeling better in a few days, so she dragged me to our family doctor. That appointment sent up red flags, and by the end of the day, I was headed to oncology. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma wasn't a death sentence, my mother had been told, but it was serious enough that there was no way I was going on tour with the group. I had been quickly replaced by a new artist named Terrell. He had a similar voice to mine, but he was older. Our manager thought he would loop in the demographic in his age group and mature the sound of guys next door. No one knew him, but the label said the guys were lucky that he was available and willing to fill in. It was supposed to be temporary until I was better. Later that year, I watched, from a chemo drip, as my friends, my brothers, what was once my future, hit the stage at the BET Awards. They shot into the stratosphere from there, and I hadn't sung with the guys next door in 15 years. The folks are finally making the big move? I asked Cash. We had all lived within blocks of each other, growing up, 
My family would be the last one still in the neighborhood. Marquise moved his brothers across town to live with their grandmother. Devon retired his parents and moved them to Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, they held out as long as they could, but they want something new and to be closer to the water. Not to mention the grandkids keep coming. Cash had two sisters, both of whom had children. He had two of his own. I guess that makes sense. So you found some stuff you can use to blackmail us? Hold over our heads or something? Cash laughed. A couple snaps of some big head kids out at the beach and stuff. I'm keeping those for our Lifetime Achievement Award ceremony. I was mostly watching tapes of the early stuff, like our first performance. You remember? I'd started laughing before he even finished his sentence. We were off key and bumping into each other through the whole first song. We got it together, eventually, but the video evidence will show that by the time we signed our deal, the guys next door had come a mighty long way. Hey, remember this one? Cash hummed the melody to She's So Sweet, a mid-tempo dance tune that was very familiar to me since I wrote it with Dave. The girls loved it since it was complimentary. Parents loved that it was only slightly suggestive. Remember it? I cackled. I dreamt that song for a year and a half after singing it all summer. And we rocked this party. That was a fan favorite. Yeah, yeah, that one too. I grinned, thinking of the futuristic hip-hop beat that Dave had put on that song. It sped up the flow and made it peppy and fun to dance to. We were well ahead of our time, music-wise. We'd listened to so many songs, so many bands, analyzed the top 40 to try to determine the secret sauce. What made a song a hit? What tanked a group? What could we do to avoid it? What are you doing with yourself these days, besides moving the folks? A whole lot of nothing, he answered. We went on hiatus after our last album. The break wasn't supposed to be this long. Not three years, you know? He paused, his long exhale crackling over the line. We've had some personnel issues. Finally kicking Terrell out. All over but the paperwork. But first we had to get Keith through rehab. His grandma died and put a hurt on him. I nodded, my mood solemn. Each of the guys had been through their hell. Marquise lost his parents in a car accident. His grandmother had raised his brothers, and when she died of cancer, it was a low blow to him. He turned to liquor and pills to heal his pain, and after he totaled a brand new Escalade, he got off easy by paying a hefty fine and completing court-ordered rehab. Cash was in a constant tug of war between the mothers of his children, back and forth to court, with a request to get some benefit the other wasn't getting. Devon never liked to sit still. He'd attempted to jump to solo, but his album was dead on arrival, and a severe hit to his ego. And Terrell? Well, Terrell had always and only been about himself in his career. He was doing fine, better than any of the other members, and that was the problem. He'd stepped outside of the group early in the game and took every opportunity to be out front and draw attention to himself. Things had finally come to a head, and the group decided at the end of their label contract to take a hiatus before signing another deal. We've been talking lately, said Cash about going back to some of the old stuff and updating it, bringing the fans into the process, you know, let them vote on their classic favorites, then bring those back, maybe writing some new stuff, but also getting back to our roots, being about the music, not about trying to hit Billboard. He paused, pushing out a little huff and clicking his tongue. We don't want to relaunch the guys next door without the original crew. We need you, man. His words shot a pang through my chest. What do you need me for? You have Terrell. Nah, we ain't got Terrell. We never had Terrell. Terrell had us. We were stepping stones to his stardom. Terrell ain't Taj. He don't do nothing but work out and oil up his six-pack. He doesn't write. He doesn't play an instrument. He doesn't choreograph. He sucks at math. But he's got a good voice. I interrupted. The rest of you filling around him. That's all you need. Not every group has to be best friends. He always sounded off. I know you hear it. He doesn't have the sound, the vision, or the history we all have. There's no nostalgia for him. He thinks our old stuff is corny, and he won't sing it. He and Devon aren't speaking because Terrell had some words about we rock this party. He said it was juvenile and simplistic. It's not a perfect jam, but you know how hard he worked on that song. Man, yeah. Don't insult an artist's work to his face. Dave was sensitive about his shit when we were kids. He was probably even worse now. Mr. Good Voice has been doing solo work. No one has heard from him in months. We couldn't meet up if we wanted to. He don't return phone calls or email. That's not fair to the rest of us, you know? 
We're not accessories. We're not Terrell Hawkins and the guys next door. He ain't no Diana Ross, and we ain't the fucking Supremes. I laughed. Not Lionel Richie and the Commodores. I bet Terrell pulls more cash than anybody. You know my dad's been all over that for a minute. Even if I hadn't seen his contract, I've seen his house and his cars. He ran out of shit to buy. He makes so much money. His cut of our royalties is ridiculous, with his features on top of that. And he lives wild. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying we're angels ourselves, but that blowback is going to hit us, and we're not getting paid enough to cover him. Cash paused, but the silence was full. I understood what he was saying and how he was feeling about it. And if Cash, the most laid-back member, was upset, I can only imagine how the other guys felt. If we ever sing again as a group, he continued, it'll be without Terrell Hawkins. None of us want him back. We want T-Dub. So you coming back, bro? Is you a guy next door or nah? I lowered my head, resting my chin in my palm. My writing credits on our songs meant that I made good money, though I wasn't recording, performing, or touring. Adding the stage show back into my life would bring everything full circle, put me right back where I wanted to be when I was 14. But my mind always boomeranged back to the life I'd built. My BSN didn't come easily. Fighting cancer had put me behind in school. I wasn't sure I'd make it. But I passed the NCLEX, the licensing exam for nursing, and worked at a hospital in Jacksonville while I wrote songs, some for the guys next door. I took a leap of faith and applied for an RN position at Lakeside Regional before it even opened, a prime position at a brand new facility in a small town, a nice mix of older and younger patients, plus the slower pace and hometown atmosphere was the breath of fresh air that I needed, and it got me out of Jacksonville, where my dream had died. I'd worked hard to get to where I was. I was going to leave stability and a normal life behind for, what, to hop on stage in some ridiculous but fashionable leather get-up, pump my hips and sing in four-part harmony about what I wanted to do to a woman? I shrugged, though Cash couldn't see me. I don't know, man. I live in Georgia. I bought a house. I have a job. It'd be tough to... The only reason you left the group was because you were sick. You would still be with us if it weren't for that, right? You've been in remission for how long now? Cash knew the answer and would still make his point even if I didn't tell him. A while... I answered quietly. My most recent scan, a year ago, had come back cancer-free. The chances of recurrence grow smaller when a patient has been in remission for five years. I was twice beyond that. But that doesn't... So it's safe to say you're good. You've been in the clear. I know you're scared to say it, but you're good, man. You're living safe and scared, but you can't run from this T-Dub, he said earnestly. It's in you. I blew out a breath slouching enough that my head could rest on the back of the chair. I don't know if I can go backward, and I don't know if I want to. Cash exhaled a heavy breath. I knew he felt like he could talk me into it. I regretted that he couldn't, but I put too much work into recovery. Not only my body, but my mind and my spirit. Becoming a nurse was about way more than a regular paycheck, and building a real person's career for myself. I was on a mission. I needed to give back what was given to me. So the boyhood dream of being a pop superstar was going to have to stay in my dreams. Chapter 7. Yvonne. All right, Sage, let us know if Bennett can keep his hands off of you with this new look you got going on. I gripped the back of the salon chair and spun it around so my client could see my handiwork. I put a little extra kick into it today. She'd asked for something fresh and young, but not too young. And I felt like I delivered with a close shave around the sides, leaving plenty up front and on top for a flirty bang. Oh, now this is cute, she crowed, turning her head from one side to the other. I handed her a mirror so that she could see the back. Oh, the line and back is so sharp. You wear that well, Sage, said Leslie from across the salon. Yvonne is so good at creating styles that fit the face. Uh Uh-huh, I see that. It's sassy, but age-appropriate. I like this. I really do. I beam with pride when my clients were happy with their hair. Even prouder when my bosses were happy, too. Now that I lived on my own, I was under pressure. I had to prove to Mama that, yes, I can make a living doing hair. I love it when I put a smile on your face. I hope Bennett is taking you someplace nice to show off that new hair. I want a lot of people to see my work. We're going to Zucco for dinner. Ben is going to think he got a whole new woman. He won't know what to do with you. You need some work on your brows, and you can get out of here. Sage peered closely at her face in the handheld mirror. 
My daughter said I have brows like Bert from The Muffet Show. You sure keep an old lady feeling young, and I appreciate that. So does my man. You're what, 48? That's not old, Sage. Leslie was applying a silver rinse to Kara Isaacs, a salon regular. She talked, waving a brush caked with product in the air. At least I hope it won't be when I get there. And even if it were, it wouldn't matter. Look at Arlene, getting ready to marry the colonel. Oh, how are the wedding plans going? I asked. I tipped Sage back in the chair so that I could work on her brows. She must be so excited. Leslie gave a short snort of laughter. She is beside herself. Got wedding magazines sitting out everywhere at City Hall. Over the top about everything. You'd think she was the only person over 60 to get married. Sage laughed, careful not to move while I worked a long thread across an already well-shaped brow. Knowing Earlene, she thinks she's the only one that counts. I'd be excited too if I were her. I was alone for five years before I met Bennett. She's been single a long time, I hear. Mmm, Leslie hummed. I was little when her husband died. It was a building collapse, I believe. I barely remember him. They'd been together since they were teenagers. She said she felt like she could never love again. Then along came the colonel. She chuckled, smoothing the tint through Miss Kara's hair while the salon listened. She said watching me and Cade gave her hope, and that warms my heart. A little. She's still a gossipy old woman in everybody's business. The shop erupted in laughter so loud that with the background music going, none of us heard the door swing open. It wasn't until a male voice called out, Excuse me, that any of us noticed someone had come in. At the front of the shop, looking good enough to eat, in a thin, long sleeve striped sweater and dark blue jeans slung low on his hips, was my landlord. When Todd said he worked odd hours, he meant it. I hadn't seen him since I'd moved in. I heard the garage door roll open at various times, mostly well into the evening. He never stopped by to say hello, never popped by for no reason, much to my disappointment. Hey! I waved a pair of tweezers at him, catching his attention. This is a surprise. You want your brows done? He grinned, showing off blinding white teeth. The man must sleep in crest strips. I heard someone named Tamara gives a great cut. I'd stop in for one. Leslie and I pointed at Tamara, whose chair happened to be empty. She propped a hand on her hip and looked him up and down. He didn't seem disturbed by the scrutiny. You sure you don't want to be at Guys and Dolls across the lake? They do men's hair over there. I went there, and the chairs were full, and so was the overflow line. The manager said if I wanted a good cut to come over here and ask for Tamara. Are you her? Uh Uh-huh. That's me. Tamara grabbed one of the new black capes with the bright white curl and dye logo and motioned Taj toward her chair. He slid into it and sat back, watching the satin float on air and settle onto his form. You like anything in particular? You want your goatee touched up too? Keep it simple, I heard him answer. I don't have time to hit the barbershop every week, so I want to keep it looking fresh for a minute. Line it up. Make it nice. I got you. With a flick of a finger, the air filled with the sounds of hair clippers and Janelle Monet. Typically, this would signal another round of salon talk, but the shop was suddenly devoid of chatter. It was so unusual, it made me uncomfortable. Leslie sent Miss Kara over to the hair dryers and got her set up under a hood. She pulled a magazine from her bag to flip through, or pretend to flip through, because she had come to love beauty shop gossip as much as any of us. Leslie tapped Taj's knee as she passed Tamara's chair. What's your name, young man? Uh, well, I don't know about that young man stuff. From what I hear, you and I aren't too far apart, age-wise. My name is Taj. I work over at Lakeside Regional Clinic. Oh, okay. She nodded, keeping busy with mundane things that she didn't have to do, but did just to stay in his face. I didn't realize Doc Moore was bringing in such young blood. What's your specialty? Specialty? Cardiology, pediatrics, internal medicine? I watched Taj's facial expression change with his effort to contain a sarcastic comment. I didn't know him well, but by now, I knew what that face meant. I busied myself with cleaning my station and prepping for my next appointment. Angela would be coming in for her monthly ritual. A wash and roller set, round brush blowout, facial, brow threading, and mani-pedi. She would be the last client of the day. Actually, he replied, I'm a nurse at Lakeside. I did a tour when the clinic was under construction. I was impressed. I applied when they started adding staff. Oh, a male nurse. Well, aren't we progressive at Lakeside? 
Leslie wasn't even pretending to work anymore. She sat in her salon chair and crossed one leg over the other. So you live here in town then? When did you move here? Did your uh, family move with you? I've just never seen you around. You're not on the basketball league or anything? I live close to the clinic, that side of town. My family is back in Jacksonville, so it's just me. I've been busy buying my house, renovating, decorating, getting settled in. I pretty much just work. Taj pressed his lips together, as if that put an end to the discussion. He didn't know the stylist at the curl and die. A discussion didn't end until they were ready for it to end. Buying a house? Renovating? Decorating? Mm Mm-hmm. Leslie turned her head toward me and gave me the silliest grin. I knew what she was doing. Tamara flipped the clippers off, picked up a different unit, then flipped them on, this time bending close to his face to fine-tune the line of his goatee. Do not move or this won't be right. You can't walk out of here looking wrong. I have a reputation to uphold. And so, Yvonne, how do you know Taj? Leslie pressed. He was my nurse at the clinic the night I fell during that storm. Fixed me right up. I showed my bandage-free hand with a tiny scar that couldn't be seen, as he'd promised. Tamara hung the clippers in their slot, then used a brush to remove loose hairs from his neck. Then she handed Taj a mirror so he could inspect her work. It wasn't anything intricate, but it was super sharp. The way he grinned when he saw himself, taking in the view from one side and then the other, he must have agreed. I cut it close so that it won't be out of control in a week. You come back and see me when you're ready for a refresh. I think I found my new barber, said Taj, then gave a low whistle. Unless... His eyes flicked up to mine, and that sarcastic half-grin flashed at me. You make house calls? I grabbed a pair of oversized scissors and snipped them in his direction. Sure, I'll bring these home and fix you right up. The moment those words left my mouth, I knew I'd messed up. Tamara and Leslie exchanged a knowing glance between them, but neither said a word. Tamara removed the cape and shook the loose hair from it, then hung it over the back of her chair, lowered the pump, and gave Taj a tap on the shoulder. Front counter, I'll ring you up there. Taj followed her, produced a card when she told him his total, and tucked the receipt into his wallet when she handed it to him. As soon as the doors closed and we'd all watched from the window as he climbed into a jet black Mercedes, both Leslie and Tamara appeared at my station, arms crossed. I glanced around them, hoping the door would swing open and Angela or anyone would walk in. Nothing. The door stayed shut, and those two stayed in my face, and Miss Kara was bent over sideways trying to eavesdrop. Home? Tamara asked, one eyebrow cocked high. Something you're not telling us about, Taj? Leslie asked. It's not what you think. Nervous for no reason, I grabbed a few items from my cabinet and began setting them out for Angela's appointment. Well, then what is it, honey? Miss Kara called from across the room. You holding out on us, Yvonne? Tamara asked. Because you seem to know him, added Leslie, and he seemed to know you. And I'm going to ask again, in case you didn't hear me. Home? asked Tamara. I fiend anger, throwing a discarded apron into my salon chair. Damn! Y'all are nosy. Taj owns the house I live in. Live in? Tamara repeated. So you two are living somewhere together in the same house? I rent his guest house. We share a garage, and there's an entrance to the house from there. Otherwise, it's a completely separate space. I glanced from Tamara's face to Leslie's and back. Seriously? I said I hadn't met my landlord and that it was a company name on the lease, but now it appears that you have. Tamara interrupted. She slowly turned, heading back to her station. He wasn't wearing a ring. Not even an indent like he had one and took it off, so is Taj available? Know what I'm saying? I blinked, flustered. I I don't know. I've never seen a woman or another car at the house. I shrugged. Leslie hummed, tapping two fingers on her chin. You'd have seen a woman if he had one. She'd come around, mark her territory, make sure you know he's not on the market— There's no way a woman would let a man that fine rent his guest house to a young single woman, certainly not if she'd ever seen Yvonne. She returned to her chair, but not before issuing a warning. Be sure to keep us posted on important developments, Yvonne, and don't leave anything out. I've got my eye on you, little secrets keeper. 
He's my landlord. And that's all. There won't be any developments. He was given quite a few lingering glances, said Miss Kara, butting in again. I know an interested man when I see one. Do you want him to be more than your landlord, dear? All right, it's not my business, but I detected a little something between him and one of the nurses at the clinic. And you know how men in health care can be. See how she deflects when she's the subject of gossip? Tamara teased. I'm not deflecting, I argued, laughing. I don't know what the big deal is. The big deal is that you were hiding some good gossip. And in this shop, that's a sin. Miss Kara closed the magazine. She would never read and tucked back into her bag. The dryer had shut off. So Leslie motioned for her to move to the shampoo bowl. Did I ever tell you ladies how I met my husband, Garth? She settled into the seat and leaned back. He was my mailman. It was two years of here's your mail before he got up the nerve to ask for my phone number. I was thankful to her for taking the heat off of me. I went back to prepping my station and trying to regulate my heartbeat. Outside of lusting after a handsome man, I hadn't given Taj a thought. But now... I couldn't wait to get home. The salon door swung open, bringing with it the scent of early spring. Angela had arrived, wearing her usual track suit and pink sneakers. Since she was getting a pedicure, she carried a pair of flip-flops in one hand and a cup from roosters in the other. Hey, hey, what's going on in here today? Hey, Miss Angela, I greeted her, grabbing her by the elbow and leading her to my chair before anyone could fill her in. I needed the shop to go back to its usual gossip about everyone but me. Come on over. I'm so ready for you.